Hi. Wired for sound once again. Uh, my wife was at the version of this I did yesterday in Oakland and was commenting that I was kind of a little hard to hear from the back. Uh, I should project more. But because this is a small, cozy, intimate room, and plus I'm wired, so that shouldn't be a problem. Everybody should be able to hear me. Now the only problem is on the content end. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I want to introduce everybody um, to, to Mark, who is our guest lecturer for today. Um, he is one of the core faculty at the Academy of Art College. University School. Universities. <laughs> they keep changing the name of it, so that uh, that big place in San Francisco that has all the buses. Um, he uh, and um, he teaches courses on perspective. He is a um, a, uh, a comic artist and uh, cartoonist. Uh, teaches lots of uh, uh, very creative classes. Does extensive journaling and notebooking, and has some. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. The intro gets kind of a little more glowing every time well, we've done. Even just knocking these out of the ballpark <laughs> really fun. Well, so you know, if I, I stumble at any point, I'm sure some of this will be walked back. But uh, anyway, um, so thank you so much for coming out. Um, lovely day, lovely space, so cozy. Uh, this is also the first time we're actually doing this on video, so I'm sure I'm going to be extra nervous and kind of you. Know, awkward, and uh, that's going to add an extra element of fun and frivolity to the proceedings. So, hi folks at home. Um, anyway, when Jack asked me to kind of consider coming in and doing a little guest talk for the Nature Journal Club, I was like, oh, yes, totally. And then I was like, okay, now what am I going to talk about? Well, obviously, there's a lot of things that um, m you know many people in this room could address just as well as I could um, about the, you know, intricacies of nature and different kinds of animals and so on. But one thing I thought that I could maybe uh, add some value is in kind of talking about uh, perspective, which is a subject I've taught and comes up a lot in things like comics and illustration. Um, and in particular, the application of perspective to, uh, you know, to what we're doing here, to nature journaling. It's normally when we think of perspective, we think of straight lines and mathematics, and you get out your right triangle and your ruler, and you're drawing room interiors and architecture and skyscrapers. And the notion of perspective as being something you can apply to your know, trees and ducks and plants and you know, your favorite walk through the woods is a kind of, uh, seems perhaps a little incongruous and that's what makes it interesting. So a lot of the illustrations in here are things I put together over the last couple of days just kind of walking around uh, Stone Lake in Golden Gate Park which is kind of right in my backyard. It's my 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 little kind of little nature getaway when I need some fresh air and to see some see some geese or whatever. I'll just kind of toodle over there and wander around the lake. Um, so this is kind of just as a scene setting thing. Uh, this is the boathouse at Stowe Lake where you can kind of rent little paddle boats and kind of you paddle around this kind of artificial island in the middle called Strawberry Hill. And this this shows a bit more of that kind of inorganic, straight line kind of perspective. The stuff on the left-hand side, perhaps, is more what we'd think, of, if I put my hand close here, I can cover the entire thing. There we go. Stuff on the left-hand is maybe more what we'd think of as, ooh, perspective drawing, show me your perspective, look at those vanishing points, whoa. 
But there's stuff on the right-hand side that's actually kind of more relevant to uh, what we're talking about here. The water and the trees and the hills and the, the little red-winged blackbird there. So we're going over to that kind of side of things, to the nature side. We'll see kind of how we can uh, involve some perspective there. It's kind of, now I'm going to be tempted to kind of you know, make little bunny shadow puppets and so on in front of this. But no, no, not to obstruct the screen. Anyway, so perspective in general is a grab bag of tricks that we can use in our drawing, our painting, and our picture making to kind of create some of the illusion of three-dimensionality on what is basically a two-dimensional page. <coughs> These tricks are... Um, so we can use these tricks to add a sense of space and depth and distance to our landscapes and to give a little bit of sense of solidity and volume and reality to things like your plants and rocks and animals that we're drawing. We can use this or not as we please. For the most part, when we're looking at nature, we're concerned with shapes and mood and the color of the things and the texture of the things. And uh, we're not so concerned with, oh, does it look physically three-dimensional? So really, this is kind of, this is like the spice that we can sprinkle on top selectively when we want to convey a sense of distance or when we want to make the things we're doing look a little more solid. We can employ as much or as little, little of it as we want to. The other thing this is kind of useful for is understanding a little bit of how distance and scale appear to our eyes can help us understand why we're seeing what we're seeing. You know, why is this here and not here? Why does the appearance of this tree change as I get closer or further from it? What's the difference between kind of those, you know, those hills over there and this one close at hand? So some of this is going to kind of perhaps enhance our understanding of why we see what we see. And we can put that down on paper as well as part of our drawing. So we'll start with something, a perspective principle it's really, really basic, perhaps the most obvious thing that we can think of. Overlaps. If object A is in front of object B, it covers it where they touch. And you can apply this to yourself by simply raising your hand and blotting me out. It's okay, I won't be offended. You bring up your hand, you can cover me. It sits in front. Your hand closer, me further away, obscures me from your view. Pretty basic. We can kind of envision that kind of uh, hair off a sheet of paper here. And so, for example, if we do that thing like a kid's drawing of a Thanksgiving turkey, right? Where I, I feel like this door may actually be a nice solid surface for me to draw on. Let's go over here. Uh, so you can do that kind of draw a turkey for Thanksgiving thing, right, where you trace around your hand. So this might represent your hand raised up in front of your eyes. And then off in the distance here we have me slightly obscured by this giant looming hand. And then behind me, the door on which I'm drawing. So your hand is closest. It overlaps me. I'm next. And I'm appearing in front of the door, which is even further behind. So we've basically become almost layers that move in front of each other. From an art standpoint, we can think of these as becoming planes, a foreground, a middle ground, and a background that kind of layer in front of each other as they go away into space. That's kind of the most elementary, basic, intuitive way we can represent distance in our drawings. And a lot of the time, that's plenty. That may be all we need to get our point across. Consider, for example, this is a view of uh, Stowe Lake. I'm standing on the shore looking across the Strawberry Hill not technically a natural landscape because this was artificially landscaped about a hundred years ago. 
But, you know, it's been there long enough we can consider it natural now. It's certainly full of plants and animals and birds and so on that nobody put there. So it become, it's become natural. So over here in the foreground, we have the shore and this neat little V-shaped tree formation. I kind of maneuvered myself around to bring that into view because I thought it was cool to have that in the foreground. It creates kind of a very close thing that clearly overlaps everything else and gives us this little extra sense of depth that we wouldn't have if I had shifted a little over to the right here and left it out of my view. Over there on the left, across the water, we have Strawberry Hill, this kind of artificial island. And off to the right here, there's this little kind of sub-island. Um, there's a number of these little kind of you know, mini islands that aren't pedestrian accessible that are used for uh, things like birds roosting. The Great Blue Herons right now, this is where they set up in the spring uh, to, with their nests. So you can see there's this little kind of cluster of uh, logs and so on that uh, seabirds, um, seagulls, sometimes cormorants will kind of sit on. And that's a little in front of the kind of coast of uh, the main island, which you can see kind of curves around behind there and passes behind it at that point. And then off in the distance between these trees and these trees, we have the trees on the far side of the lake, which is the most distant thing that I can see. So I've kind of positioned myself here and kind of adjusted my drawing a little bit to try and show these overlaps as clearly as I can. And if we go through and now color code these, you can see the foremost thing is that V-shaped tree formation, and then the shore and the reeds and so on, the expanse of water leading away, the islands across the water, that little kind of outgrowth where the herons nest, sitting in front of those shapes, and then kind of the more distant trees on the far side of the lake. So this is the most fundamental way in which we can show that something is closer than something else. Kind of another fairly obvious thing that we see every day, and I think you know, most of us are pretty familiar with, uh, this, uh, the fancy name for it, diminution. This is the principle that as things get further from us, they look smaller. Pretty basic. If I were to advance menacingly towards you, looming up in your field of vision, I would become bigger and bigger. If I turn and run away off into the distance, you see me diminish in size. When we see objects, creatures, anything that we can assume should be about the same size and one is bigger than the other, the difference in scale suggests a difference in distance. I'm going to return over here to my wall drawing. So if you have, for example, a big person, in your field of vision, and a little person in your field of vision, without any other kind of context or cues, you would assume, not that this is like a giant golem and this is like a tiny little you know, fairy, your assumption is going to be this is a close person, this is a far person. Likewise, if we see a couple of trees that are otherwise similar in kind of type and proportion, and one of them is a big tree, and the other is a little tree. And then we have a tree that's maybe kind of medium. Without any kind of overlapping or context or any other cues, we're going to assume this is the closest tree. This one's further and this one's further yet. And this little thing, if we're told that this is a tree rather than like a flaming matchstick, we're going to assume that's a very distant tree. Simply because we're comparing these, judging them to be the same manner of thing and the smaller ones we assume are more distant. A fancier thing, something that's less intuitive and requires a little bit of study and observation, what we call atmospheric perspective. If we think about air, instinctively we tend to think of air as being something that's not there, transparent, invisible, intangible. We're barely even aware it exists unless we have a stiff wind blowing in our faces. Yeah, it does have not just some kind of substance to it, but also it affects our visibility over distance. As we look through layers of air, molecules, dust, pollen, water vapor, gas, all these little particles and things that are filling that space. Over time, 
uh, and over distance rather, you get enough of them between you and the thing you're looking at. They actually affect the appearance of the thing on the other side of all that air. In general, things that are close to us, the dark parts of them will appear darker. We notice more contrast, more distinct difference between the lighter and darker parts. When we say value, that's a kind of our fancy art term for how light or dark something is. An object that's close at hand will display a greater contrast, a greater distinction between its light and dark parts. Things that are far away, their colors will generally seem less intense. Their darker parts, at least during daylight, will appear lighter than the dark parts of things that are close at hand. We mo may notice a shift in colors over that distance. In general, during daylight in this kind of climate, distant objects will may take on a bluish tint. Things like hills and mountains, as they recede from our vision, they'll turn paler and kind of more bluish tinted. That's not a universal rule. We can't say that everything that's further away will be bluer than things that are close at hand. Ultimately, this is something we can look for, but if it doesn't match what we observe, what we observe is more important. So, for example, um, this is at the San Francisco Zoo. They have a rather nice, large uh, African savanna area where various species of animals, zebras, crown cranes, giraffes, uh, dumb but lovable ostriches, can kind of wander back and forth and intermingle. There's a lot to see there. The closest thing to hand here is these, is these zebras. So like, say, a penguin is a, certainly an animal that offers us a lot of dark and light contrast, black stripes, generally white hide, although you know, being an animal, it's not going to stay in kind of a pristine white shape for very long. Uh, but generally whitish, generally blackish. So in drawing these, I've tried to retain the maximum amount of contrast with those foreground zebras. As we go away, the contrast between the dark and light parts of the giraffes is much less sharp. There is much less variation in the light and the dark between them. And likewise, as we go away from our foreground little zebra wallow over the hill and then towards the distant plants, I'm making the colors less intense, the variation in those colors less dramatic, reducing the amount of detail, lightening things generally. There's one part of this drawing that I was kind of unhappy with. Well, actually, two things happened as I was drawing this. One of these being kind of uh, something that happened with my paint, uh, with my paint selection, and the other being something that the zebras did. Obviously, I was gearing up to draw the most magnificent view of a zebra's hindquarters that you have ever laid eyes on, and then my model ceased to cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, well, there we go. We have a little action arrow and a sound effect. That's, you know, the, the <laughs> so I. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Oh, no, totally. Thank you. And the other thing that happened here was I kind of feel I kind of feel like looking back on this that I made this tree, especially that shadow there, too dark. I feel it kind of brings that tree forward more than I wanted it to. It's as if it's muscling its way forward into the same kind of foreground plane of the zebras. Fortunately, through the magic of Photoshop, I can go in and fix that. So that's a subtle little thing. In hindsight, I wish I'd made that lighter. I can gimmick it uh, digitally. You can see the difference there, in effect. By making that lighter, I knock it back a little bit. It competes less for your attention. It fades into the background, as we say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like maybe it's kind of hovering over the zebra's back a little bit, doesn't it? It looks like it's like on the front of that area. Yeah. yeah. I think some of this is a 
result of just the behavior of air and of the passage of light. So some of it, you can say, well, it's objectively true. If you took a photograph anywhere in the world, some of these are principles that you would notice. Um, as far as which of these, of the many perspective effects you choose to emphasize in your art, I think that is very culturally specific. Just to take one example, um, our eyes and our brain do a lot of adjustment to what we see to kind of fix it and to help us extract useful information from it. Um, one thing being that when you look at something, your eyes automatically focus on it. Um, so our perception of the world is something where things within the limits of our eyes, mine aren't actually very good, but now I've fixed them. Um, anything you look at is going to appear to be in sharp focus. Our perception of the world is that everything is in focus at all times, simply because when we look at something, we focus on it. We never really have the perception of the world as being filled with things that are blurry. If you take a photograph or you're filming something with a movie camera, they have a much, their focus is fixed. And if they're focused on an actor's face, the background will take on a blurry quality. And if our attention wanders to that background, you know, hey, that's all blurry. What's up with that? It's kind of, it's a true thing about optics that we're not conscious of because we're generally only focusing on one thing at once and our eyes and our brain are bringing that to sharp focus. The notion that backgrounds are blurry is something that is optically true. It's not part of a day-to-day -day experience, but we're conditioned now, after looking at a ton of photographs and movies, to assume that's the case. So when we're drawing sometimes, you know, drawing or painting a lot of time, we'll create that kind of photographic effect of having the background be blurry because we've been exposed to that through our media consumption, even though it's not something you would notice if you were born into the world with like your pad of paper and a paintbrush, it would never occur to you that things are like that. Just a comment on that and a question. Um, as things are further away, you do lose a little detail though, so you will sort of get that kind of effect depending on the part of something else. Yeah, so that... Oh. And then mechanics, um, you're taking the drawings and what are you scanning them in and then you're able to, to, to edit them in Photoshop? Yeah, my basic drawings, I, where did I put my sketchbook? Ah, here we go. Generally, I try to do as much as I can on the page when I'm drawing. Um, say, for example, here's that last shot of still late. So I try to do as much as I can on the page. I'm much happier working on paper with pen and ink and watercolor than I am fiddling with things on the computer. So every now and then there's something which happens when I'm drawing or I put down a big blob of liquid paper I then regret or I get smudgy fingerprints over it that I kind of want to then amend after I've scanned it. Um, I generally refrain from meddling on that level. It is, it is neat. This, is a this allows us to explore kind of what-if scenarios. What if I'd made that red instead of blue? What if that were darker and that lighter? Um, so yeah, it's, it's great for teaching. You can explore kind of very similar alternate realities where I used a slightly different mix of paint there. And you can see what would happen. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent questions. Okay. Oh, I need to point this actually at the computer. A little bit more an atmospheric perspective. In general, everything in the world has a kind of inherent color that it actually is. If we were to examine it in strong lighting with no particular color tints or shadows or interfering atmosphere, we would perceive its intrinsic, what we call its local color, at full strength, without interference. And our eyes and our brain, when we look at something, they're trying to figure out what color is this thing. If we see a banana, it's kind of useful to us to perceive the yellowness of that banana, and our perceptions kind of shift to allow us to see it. But in fact, the colors of things that we see are very much affected by the circumstances under which we see them. If we look at this marker, it's kind of cherry red. We perceive that. If we were to draw it, we would try and honor that redness of the marker and to represent it to the best of our abilities. And yet, if I hold it up here in the light, it becomes lighter. But I think because this is kind of a cool bluish light, the red doesn't become particularly intense. 
I think if I were to take a cooler color from the cool light, we might see a little bit more intensity in that blue. The light's kind of favoring it. If we move these things into the sunlight outside, you would see probably the red would really sing because we're getting some warmish light from the sun and it's going to really make this red much more vibrant than we're perceiving it here. So the appearance of these local colors is greatly affected by the amount of light they're getting, the kind of the color of that light, the interfering effects of the atmosphere. If the appearance of this red could change so radically based on the conditions under which we're seeing it, then we can't possibly be seeing it full strength right here. So one of the things that we want to do, especially when we're doing a larger drawing, we want to put things in some kind of context, is to notice what are we actually seeing versus what, what do we know it is. That tree, we may know it's green, but what we're seeing may be brown or yellow or blue or something else entirely, depending on the circumstances. So when in doubt, we want to trust our eyes over our kind of our knowledge of the colors of things and over any kind of theory that people may feed you, including the stuff I'm telling you. If I tell you those trees will appear blue in the distance, and when you look at them, they actually seem to have turned brown, that's what you're seeing, that's what you want to record. As another example, in Golden Gate Park again, I'm on my way to Stowe Lake, going along the driveway. And this is about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, pretty strong daylight. Um, and Kind of what I'm noticing here is the most distant trees around the bend of that road do take on this pale bluish tint in accordance with textbook theory. So that uh, kind of, that's validated. On the other hand, when I look at the grass, and I've started to notice this a lot with areas of grass, if close at hand it seems greener. As it recedes away from me, it takes on kind of a more yellowish, golden kind of color. I, I notice that a lot now when I look at expanses of grass as the colors shift from green to a more yellowish color. That doesn't accord with textbook theory, but it's true to what I'm, what I'm observing, so I want to record that with my paints. In general, when we're looking at near and far things, I think it's useful to just ask ourselves, how does the color shift over distance? If I compare this to this, what's the difference? Darker, lighter, bluer, yellower? And then to try and record that honestly, we can figure out later on, if we're curious, what combination of physics and optics and biology and the angle of incidence of the light and any number of other things conspire to create that effect. But it's most important simply to notice it. Uh, what other kind of things are going on here that give us a sense of distance among these different trees and so forth? curves and narrows, that's a subtle hint. Absolutely. We go from the hyper-detailed tree in the foreground here, and then less detailed here, and then these guys are just outlines. Uh, what else? Yeah, I put in some people here for scale, and there's a lady with a baby carriage and a couple people under the, kind of the shadow of that tree there, and they get progressively smaller. There are a bunch of people going to and fro. It's a nice kind of, uh, well, I think it was a Sunday afternoon. So the park's full of people, but I'm not going to draw all of them because I'm basically here to draw trees. But I selected a few of them just to provide a sense of scale because I thought that was kind of fun. Otherwise, it would look like you know, the zombie apocalypse had happened and everybody had left. <laughs> a completely empty park would be unnatural, but I'm not here to draw the Boston Marathon. And in general, I'm trying in the most literal, look it up in the dictionary sense, the horizon line, if we were standing on a flat plane or gazing out to sea, it's this flat line we see off in the distance where the sky meets the water or the ground surface. It's where the world appears to end. Basically due to the curvature of the Earth, at a certain point it kind of drops out of our view and begins curving away like the back of a giant turtle. I believe, uh, last time I looked this up, for a person of average height standing at sea level, it's actually about three miles away, which is closer than I would have thought. But uh, the, other, the thing that's really interesting about this is it's going to appear right in front of your eyes, at your eye level. 
if you climb up a hill or a ladder or to the top of a skyscraper or look out the window of an airplane, it will come with you. It will follow you to that height. If you crouch down, it will drop with you. If you envision yourself as standing on, you know, on a beach looking out to sea, doing kind of, you know, sit, you know, doing these kind of little crouching motions and making people wonder what, what on earth you're doing, you'll see that horizon line is going to travel up and down, tracking your eyes. Quite simply, everything below your eye level is something you're looking down upon. Everything above your eye level is something you're looking up at. There's actually a very charming and whimsical example of this from a book called Perspective Made Easy by Ernest Norling, published in the 50s. It's actually my favorite book on perspective because it's very gentle, uh, very approachable, and he uses lots of these very kind of easy to visualize, somewhat whimsical real life examples. So Norling writes, imagine yourself wearing a diving helmet and seated in your room, making a sketch of the interior. As you sit there, the room is filled with water until it just reaches the height of your eyes. Now then, everything in the room that is below, that is under the water, is below your eye level. Everything that is not under water is above the eye level. And the high water mark around the walls is your eye level. Every time I think about the horizon line on the eye level, I kind of flash back for a second to this notion of you're sitting there in your room wearing a diving helmet, calmly oblivious of the fact your room is being steadily flooded, and you don't care, you've got your waterproof sketchbook and your waterproof pens, and you're just, you know, I'm going to draw that underwater couch, it's good, it's damp, it'll, it'll dry out. Yeah, pretty much, <laughs> you know, as long as you've got your diving helmet and your drawing supplies, you're, you're, you're chill. So, yeah. I also like that he writes in the helmet. <laughs> it's very conversational. Yeah. You know, you, you get the sense of this slightly fusty kind of mid-20th century professor kind of narrating this little thing. Uh, that's kind of my, I aspire to this kind of mode of instruction generally. The, the silly examples and the, the, the chatty tone. So, when we're looking at this kind of scene, on the left hand side we can kind of see this principle applied fairly clearly. My eye level here is basically about here. You can see if we were to follow the surface of that lake off into the infinite distance, it would probably terminate around there. And if we follow that line off the left, we'll see it kind of runs through these railings in front of the cafe. That's about my eye level. So the roof of the cafe here is something I'm looking slightly up at. I can see a little of the underside of it. These benches I'm looking down upon. Likewise, these a row of boats. The ground, obviously. Uh, the top of this boat that this happy couple are paddling off in. I can look down into it because it's below me. It is, in that Norling example, underwater. You're also seeing a little bit of that principle of diminution here with this row of rentable paddle boats. Because they're all structurally identical, we can assume that the ones that are further away, uh, or uh, the ones that are smaller or more distant, they overlap each other and they also diminish in size. Those basic principles of overlapping and decreasing size with distance would tell us which paddle boats are near and which are far, even if we didn't apply any other perspective. The fact that we're above them, that our eye level is above them, enables us to peer down into the tops a little bit, likewise with the park benches. You can see that if we kind of zoom in a little bit on that. Uh, there are kind of our near and far paddle boats getting progressively smaller. The tops of the benches, a little bit of the underside of the cafe. One other thing we'll notice here, if we look at the positioning of those paddle boats and of the benches, is that as things get more distant from us, assuming they're sitting on a level surface, they also are going to, their position is going to approach the horizon. The near paddle boats are situated lower in our field of vision than the far paddle boats. If we were to extend that line of paddle boats all the way to the horizon where they pass out of our view, they would eventually be sitting right on the horizon just before they disappear. This is going to apply to trees as well. Let's turn again. 
to our handy door. Grab a marker. So, if we have our eye level, if we're looking out across an expanse of level ground, a tree that's close to us will begin pretty far below our eye level, below that line of the horizon, and it will extend quite far above it. A more distant tree will originate from the ground at a point that's higher up, closer to our eye level, and assuming it's a tree of the same height, or similar height, it will terminate at a lower point that is closer to our eye level. A more distant tree yet will come out of the ground higher, will terminate lower, and so forth, until eventually, if we pursue this all the way to the horizon, we end up with trees that are basically squatting right on that line and then vanish into obscurity. Yes? Right. If we envision a big old tree kind of standing next to us, we would have to look up at its branches and gaze down at its roots. Things that are very far away, they get smaller and smaller. They fit more comfortably within our field of vision. And they also tend to appear flatter. We're pretty much looking at them completely from the side. Something close at hand, we have to look up at the top and down at the bottom. Something far away, we're just seeing straight on. We're getting more of a profile view. Glad you asked. <laughs> I have in my pocket. This is a downhill view. I'm standing on top of Strawberry Hill, quite high up. My eye level, the horizon, is actually up here. You can just about see it. There's a part here I can peer over the tops of these, uh, tops of these trees and see all the way to the Pacific Ocean, as represented by that little red line. So I'm here, maybe, I don't know, 40, 50 feet up, however high one needs to be to peer over the tops of those trees. They're sitting down um, pretty much on the shore of the island, level with the water surface. We can see the lake here. There on the far side, we have the path that goes around the lake and a driveway for cars and a couple of little people for scale and their foliage and all that kind of thing. And then these trees that are down by the uh, lakeside they rise up, and I'm situated high enough, I can just peer over them and see the Pacific Ocean meeting the sky and that first little tinge of imminent sunset. I'm up here drawing this for about an hour, and of course, in the process of that, it's getting later and later. It's getting darker and colder, and I'm starting to think I should wind this up. Um, but yeah, so we're starting to see kind of sunset just coming on there. What we hear is actually a hill that rises up, crosses the horizon as the peak of that hill takes it a little higher than my position. There's a little building there, perhaps with a little artist in it who's drawing Strawberry Hill from a slightly higher vantage point than I enjoy. So momentarily, you, imaginary artist, have the advantage over me. The overall view is framed here by a couple of trees that are growing right out of the side of the path that I'm standing on, kind of forming this big kind of almost enclosing U shape. These are trees that are very close at hand. Their roots come out level with my feet. And their trunks pass way up here, far out of my view. They loom over me by dozens of feet. We're looking down here, the slope of the hill. I position myself just so I can look over the edge and see that very sharp downward slope. So each of these trees is originating from a point that's kind of lower and lower on the hill. Because the downward slope of the hill kind of cancels out that kind of upward shift that you would see on level ground, it almost seems like the base of these trees are almost aligned. These ones close at hand are a little lower. These ones a little higher. These ones would be a little higher yet. But the downward slope of the hill almost cancels out that effect. The main thing I'm noticing is the trees that are lower and smaller, I'm able to see over the top of. The ones that are closer <coughs> and bigger pass way up out of my field of vision.
once more, having laid out initially that general rule that I would attempt to concentrate the darkest values in the foreground, I'm breaking that rule here for, our, for a dramatic effect. The darkest values are actually these trees and essentially the middle ground, these kind of silhouette shapes that are appearing in front of the, uh, the ground plane. Um, normally, I would concentrate the darkest values in the foreground, but I've kind of broken that rule here because I thought, well, I don't, I can't really draw the intricate details of all this foliage, but if I make that black, and then the foreground trees are kind of a medium value, and then the distance is the lightest value, I can separate out those planes. So this isn't necessarily photographic reality, and I'm not following my general rule that I would use in deciding where to apply the blacks. I'm kind of manipulating things mostly to try and separate out these different overlapping layers as clearly as I can. Also having some of the, these added some uh, lights into some of the vegetation in the foreground using a little bit of liquid paper, um, which adds more contrast to the foreground, yeah. which helps pop that uh, foreground closer. Yeah. So it's got dark looking and some lights from yeah. that liquid paper. Now. I can so pass this around for... Well, in this case, I was actually using a, a gel pen. Um, this is, it's kind of a, a weird and slightly messy trick, but um, pretty much I'll just put down a little scribble of gel pen and then smear it with my finger while it's still wet to lighten something that I made a little darker than I wanted to. Kind of equivalent to taking a white pencil and kind of scribbling over something. So, yeah, that's why I end up with such dirty fingers when I... Yeah, the Yunbo signal. I think that's kind of the best uh, white gel pen I found. Um, you get them in stationery stores. They sell. The, I got these at uh, the Mido store in San Francisco, Japantown. But yeah, the Yunbo signal is a very nice white gel pen. You can pass that around as well. So yeah, every now and then, I'll kind of overshoot. I'll make something a little darker than I wanted to, and then I may resort to desperate measures to correct that. Um, I prefer not to rely on the prospect of I'll fix it in Photoshop. If I can fix it on the page, I'll feel better about it. <coughs> no matter how crude the techniques I have to use. Okay. Kind of continuing on from that horizon line concept. It's a notion of ellipses. An ellipse is basically a flattened circle. What we'll notice, given a particular line of the horizon is when we're looking at a circular shape, like a dinner plate or something, the closer it is, to our, the closer it appears in our field of vision to eye level, the flatter it will appear. The further above or below it in our field of vision, the rounder it will appear. So, for example, another giant post-it note. If we envision a horizon line, I'm going to quickly sketch in a series of progressively wider elliptical shapes. I need to proceed fairly carefully with this or I'm going to draw something weird that will confuse you. Okay. So these elliptical shapes could be anything. They could be the bases of like puffy clouds, for example. Or flying saucers or giant fried eggs. Uh, manhole covers, what have you. But generally, for the clouds that are close to us, or, or not that are close to us, the clouds that are far above our eye level for whatever reason, we see more of their underside. As they get further away, they become flatter and flatter until eventually they'll just look like a little profile view, like a little puffy bowler hat. Likewise, as we look down, if we think of these as being, say, tree stumps, a series of tree stumps getting closer and closer to us, those that are closer at hand will appear in our field of vision further 
from our eye level and consequently rounder. More distant ones will look flatter. The tree stump that happens to exactly cross the horizon will appear completely flat. We gaze straight across the top of it. Interestingly, this only depends on how far above our eye level it appears to us. It doesn't matter if that's the result of distance or the height of the object. If we had, next to this, something that's all a column of some kind, that originates like a tree trunk below our eye level and extends far above it, and this could be anything. It could be a rocket ship. I kind of feel like I'm going to go with my, what I've been doing this week and make it the world's tallest birthday cake. And this could be like a layer cake. It's got frosting and then it's separated into layers that we can see. And as these layers des tr descend down the length of the cake towards our eye level, these kind of elliptical curves that we observe will flatten out the stack of the cake that crosses our eye level will appear completely flat. As you look down below our eye level, they get these rings get curvier and curvier until finally we get down to the plate and kind of there's our little knife for cutting the cake, which is going to be a neat trick because we need to get an entire slice. <laughs> or a ladder and uh, it's just yeah something. And then you need a little cake slice to lift it out without dropping it. It would be a challenge. And all of this for a baby. Anyway. <laughs> but we see similar curvature here, whether it's a very tall object that's close to us, or objects that are just getting further away. It only depends on where this ellipse is located relative to that horizon line. And we can generalize and say the same kind of phenomenon will be observed with, say, I don't know, welcome mats. That a welcome mat that's close to us will appear, and if we'll see more of its top surface than one that's further away. And these will appear progressively flatter and more sliver-like as they recede from our vision. So this is a thing about perspective that we can apply to our drawing things in nature, such as trees. So here's a tree viewed from some distance. Um, it looks pretty flat. We're viewing it from far away. It's kind of the profile of a tree. If we were to stalk this tree slowly and carefully, so as not to alarm it, some trees are skittish. As we get a little closer, it appears bigger to us. It fills up more of our field of vision. At this point, I need to tip my head back to see the top branches. I'm also seeing, for those upper branches that are appearing higher in my field of vision, further from my eye level, they take on a more rounded appearance as I see more of their undersides. If we look at that top cluster of branches here, it's like a little cone that we're seeing from the side. Here it becomes a rounded shape that we're looking up at. And that has to do with simply how high above our eye level it's located. As I get closer yet, it passes up really out of, if not out of my uh, field of, out of my possible field of vision, certainly far beyond the scope of my paper. And even those lowest ring of branches, which were once completely flat, and here have some roundness to them, become rounder yet as I see more and more there on the side. If I put these next to each other, I've kind of aligned them here based on my eye level. Fortunately, I was stalking this tree across a flat stretch of road, so my eye level remained fairly constant. I've also drawn these basically to scale. Um, what I did here was I actually took the tip of a pen, put it on my nose, like that, and went, okay, how high up that how high up that pen is the top of that tree? It came to about here on my pen. And then as I advanced to my next viewing position, 
which was largely based on whether or not the sun was shining right in my eye, so I'm moving from one patch of shade to another as I stalk the tree. And then I would pull out my pen and go, okay, where does the tip of that pen fall? And now it falls about here at the top of this cluster of leaves. So I was able to actually draw these in scale based on how much of my field of vision they were taking up. The pen tip is pretty much the furthest thing I can see while I'm looking straight ahead. So everything above that line is basically something that normally would be out of my field of vision entirely and I have to look up in order to encompass. And if we were to sketch our impression of these general kind of shapes, the ellipses formed by these kind of rings of branches and leaves, they would look something like this. The more distant tree has fairly flat ellipses. As we advance on it, it gets bigger. The upper branches move further and further away from the eye level and take on a rounder and rounder appearance. At any given point, we get a similar degree of roundness. The lower branches here appear about as round as the middle branches here. Those appear about as round as the highest branches here. As we get closer, the top and bottom of the tree move away from our eye line, and they get progressively rounder and rounder. I should note at this point, um, in addition to this awesome video recording, um, we will be putting this slide presentation up on Jack's site for your later perusal. So if there's anything here that for some reason you feel worthy of in-depth study, you'll have access to this to, uh, to look at all you like. I, so yes. Something that I think is just really cool about this is kind of going back to these trees here. So what you're saying is it's not the same drawing of the tree, just larger. Yeah. It's a totally different view of the tree here than here. Because here, I'm looking straight out at the, uh, the top of the tree. Here, I'm looking up at it. Um, I think that's sort of these two things side by side are, 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 are a useful thing to observe. Yeah, so I have a tendency, I think, to kind of build that in whenever I'm drawing things in the back of my mind, just through practice. I'm always thinking, well, what's the view of this? How high or low is, is it? And I will adjust my drawing of things to reflect you know, whether they're far above or below or eye level. It's kind of a little bit of second nature for me now. Um, it's not always necessary. We aren't obliged to adjust our depiction of the things we're seeing to conform with the, law, uh, with the laws of perspective. It's optional, but this is something which, if we're deliberately trying to create the effect of scale, we can look for and kind of play up and make sure we're kind of you're getting across in our drawing. And maybe this helps us understand a little bit of what we observe. If we're wondering, why does this tree look different from this tree? There's something, I can't quite put my finger on it. This may help you kind of decode that and figure out the difference between a tree viewed from up close versus that tree over there that's far away. They do look a little different, and that's probably going to explain why. Imagine if Jack, who appears determined to take over this presentation, were waiting for me oh, <laughs> at this tree. When, when I invited collaboration from the audience, I, 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 I didn't mean just Jack. <laughs> and then he's kind of waving. So yes, that would be the appearance of Jack, his head remaining level with my own on the horizon line, and his feet getting further and further below you know, on a plane with that tree, right, where, the, where that tree comes out of the side of the path as I approach. Yes? I'm very confused by this. Mm -hmm. Are you, the horizon line is staying the same. Are you moving closer to the tree? And in that case, wouldn't the horizon line change? 
the horizon line doesn't change unless my altitude changes. It's only affected by your height, the height of your viewing position. So it doesn't change as you get closer and closer no. to it? It remains constant, unless you actually crouch down or you're going up or downhill or up and down the ladder. The horizon doesn't move as you approach it. If you envision yourself walking out you know, across a beach, the line of the sky and then the sea remains the same no matter how near or far it is. Does that make sense? It's something to look for, um, you know, to observe as we're kind of walking about and to kind of, you know, wow, I wonder where the horizon line is. Can I see it? How does it change as I move up or downhill? Or conversely, no, I, I, I'm, I'm going to put in an elephant. So Jack's waiting there next to, I know, Babar, king of the elephants. <laughs> and then, you know, we would see, you know, Babar's head is going to kind of be like the treetop, the further away we are. <laughs> Yes, the top of this tree is still whatever, like you know, 30 or 40 feet over your head. But as you get closer to it, it moves up in your field of vision, which is why I want to emphasize that point. It doesn't matter, like in measuring the ruler terms, how high this is. It merely matters how high it appears to you. Again, this represents kind of the limit of my field of vision, the tip of that pen. As I get closer, this tr the top of this tree rises up out of my easy field of vision. As it rises up in my view, it becomes rounder and rounder in appearance. It doesn't matter the actual textbook physical height of that thing. It merely matters how far or close it is to my eye level, to that horizon line, as far as my field of vision is concerned. Does that make sense? It may take a little bit of kind of parsing and contemplation. Um, the fifth view of the branches changes. As you get closer to it, it may help kind of reinforce this or help you understand it. But uh, I think probably move on from here. I have something which also kind of pertains to this. That's kind of an application of this, which hopefully will deepen your understanding rather than m making it even more confusing. But let's see what happens. So another application of this, uh, I see Jack has a plate which he can kind of be elevate and lower for our edification. But, but another application of this, if we think about, I used here the example of welcome mats. Um, if we were to envision an animal standing on that welcome mat, if we envision the area under its feet on which it's standing, or the area of water from which an animal emerges, the appearance of that flat shape is going to change with perspective as well. For example, you have here, go back to the uh, San Francisco Zoo, you have an open-billed stork uh, in the African aviary, the poor bachelor stork, he doesn't have a mate, so during, during mating season he gets a bit crabby and they have to kind of move him away. You know, kind of like a, kind of like a, a, a poor single person on Valentine's Day. He doesn't need his bill rubbed in it. Um, but yeah, so here we're kind of looking down at him. He's situated pretty far below our eye level, fairly close, and so this kind of, the, if we were to trace an ellipse around his feet representing the area on which he's standing, it's a shape that we can see kind of quite a lot of the top of. If you were more distant, it would appear smaller, and his feet would be positioned closer to our eye, eye level, and that imaginary welcome mat shape would be considerably flatter. There would be much less, his feet would appear much less spread out, we'd be seeing them much more from the side. Likewise, the hippo. Um, I 
they kind of tend to change his name from time to time. Uh, he first came to the San Francisco Zoo as Tucker. He was then renamed Brian Wilson after a local athlete who then left town and he's got a new name now. I first knew him as Brian, so to me he's Brian the Hippo, which I think is a very hippopotamic uh, kind of name. <laughs> Here, I, the main thing I want to capture, this is what he tends to do a lot of the day. Uh, the main thing I want to capture is the particular kind of shape his head makes as it comes through the surface of the water. You can see his head is tilted a little bit because this eye is sitting just above the water line, this ear is below it. His other ear is rakishly raised from the water. His muzzle is largely clear. So we can actually trace kind of the water line around his head. And I tried, kind of, this is similar to the atmospheric perspective principle, I tried to get across a kind of a difference in appearance between the submerged and non-submerged parts of him. We have more contrast and more glossiness where he's above the water, and more kind of murky dimness where it's below the water surface. The water being not entirely clear, even less so considering that he's pooping in it. <laughs> Why they, uh, that's why they kind of you know, flush the whole thing and refill it every day. It's just no talking to these hippos. Anyway, so if I try to envision where that water line would continue around the far side of his head, it's out of my view. I'm here just trying to trace in my imagination how that water line would continue as it wraps all the way around Brian's head. I might get a shape something like that. The appearance of that shape suggests what kind of view I have of the water surface. In this view, where it appears fairly round, suggests that I'm looking down on him, which I am, from fairly close at hand. Were he further away, he would be closer to my eye level, and that kind of elliptical shape of the water line around his head would appear considerably flatter. And you'd get more of a view like this eye shape. Yeah, a view, if I were to crouch down, uh, if I were scuba diving, in, the ta uh, in his pool with Brian, which is not recommended because they are actually extremely dangerous animals. I think uh, actually the most, in terms of like the number of people who, who uh, get killed by them, they are the most dangerous animal in Africa. Even ahead of the Cape, the notoriously cranky Cape Buffalo. I would see something like this. And then here he is, the whole rest of his considerable bulk under the water surface it would appear like this. That would be if either he were very, very, very far away from me and I had a, like a telescope, or if I were to hunker down until my eye level actually is level with the water surface. This would perhaps be the view of another hippo. The example, if we have a bunch of birds, I think it's a scientific term, we have a murder of crows, a parliament of ravens, a bunch of assorted birds. The birds who are closer to me, looking down onto the water surface, I'm looking down upon this guy. If I were to trace the water line around his body, it would be a fairly full ellipse. The birds who are more distant, that water line, which I've kind of sketched in here, appears flatter. So just like our kind of hypothetical welcome mats or clouds or tree stumps, the more distant, the closer they draw to my eye level and the flatter those shapes become. Looking down on all those? Yeah, because I'm not under the water, um, the entire surface of the lake, every bird that's sitting on it is beneath me. My actual eye level will be up here out of frame. So essentially, if my eye level is here, I'm looking down below it, drawing all these birds. So every single one of these birds is beneath me. Not in moral terms, but <laughs> purely <laughs> physical ones. I'm not here to argue that I don't have a high, I have like an irrational animus towards seagulls, but I think very highly of coots. 
I'm fair <laughs> neutral to positive on ducks, warming to geese, and I have the highest regard of all for the pied bill breed, which I think is just darling. Um, so yeah, on the whole, I would say these birds are not morally beneath me, unless <laughs> physically I'm looking down upon them from an unearned position of uh, superiority. And so this doesn't represent the body of the bird. I'm merely trying to visualize a kind of a cross-section through its body, the water line running around that bird's body where it dips into the surface of the water. It continues below with its little duck feet and its goose belly and so on. I'm not trying to capture that. I'm trying to illustrate here just the shape that makes and how it becomes flatter as the birds become more distant and draw closer to my eye level. No, it's possible. It's possible that uh, creatures that kind of exist uh, below us may have an inverted association of kind of morality with uh, altitude. Uh, perhaps the uh, the crab that scuttles along the bottom of the uh, the sea, clacking its claws, views that as uh, the essentially a symbolic representation of moral superiority. One thing that's kind of fun is uh, gophers. Um, every now and then, you may see them kind of throwing garbage out of their hole onto the surface. I have a bottom of a Coke bottle uh, that I found that I saw a gopher kind of excavating and shoving up on the surface because in the process of tunneling, it came across this garbage. And as every gopher knows, the surface world is where you dump your garbage. <laughs> so we're probably dealing there with a completely inverted kind of moral compass where, you know, where you know, <laughs> underground is kind of the place to be. And that's like you know, kind of some kind of and the world we inhabit is some kind of like overly brightly lit open sewer, <laughs> where you go out of strict necessity to uh, grab mouthfuls of grass, and when your mom kicks you out of the burrow, and you have to start your own hole. So yeah. Have you done a comic on this? I think I may have to. I think you may have to. I'm developing this entire kind of visualization of a uh, kind of the the, the 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 cosmology of a gopher. Anyway, another kind of fancy thing we can do. Normally when we're drawing animals, particularly birds, we're concerned with their outline. Um, you know, the profile or the shapes that they make. That's the most interesting thing about them. It's a strong aid to identification. It's cool to observe how that outline will change as they kind of you know, adjust their feather positions. They, you know, they puff out their feathers or raise or lower their crest. And that's fascinating and interesting. And it's valuable for observations of animals. A lot of the time, we, we're more interested in the flat shape. They don't need to look three-dimensional. We don't need to impress somebody with our ability to communicate the volume of this bird. But if we want to, if that's something we observe or we're interested in and we want to convey in our drawing of them, it may help us to kind of visualize the critter we're looking at in terms of simple shapes, our kind of basic kind of building blocks. Balls and cylinders and blocky blocks. If we can kind of look at what we're seeing, kind of boil it down to some kind of fairly simple shape, we can hold it in our mind and go, OK, and I'm viewing it from this kind of direction. So its appearance might be thus. We can relate it to simple, familiar, crude shapes that we see every day, if it's kind of box-like or like a cone, and we go, okay, and therefore that explains the appearance I'm seeing. The most basic way of representing these kinds of geometric shapes is what we call, in fancy art terms, isometric view. This is a view basically undistorted by perspective, in which the parallel lines of the sides of this block remain parallel forever. If we were to extend them off into the distance, they would never meet. They were to carry along a couple of train tracks forever and ever, never crossing or converging. Well, it's a species of perspective, perhaps. It's a simplified approach to perspective. If we were studying perspective in kind of the normal academic sense, we would go, well, we're drawing architecture or buildings or room interiors, and it's very important 
that we represent accurately the convergence of these lines towards their proper vanishing points, which when we get out our ruler and our right triangle, we can look. But, you know, that's something we observe more with things that are really big and or really close to us. For the most part, when we're looking at animals, we're not that close, they're not that big, and this kind of simple representation, where they're undistorted by perspective effects, is actually even more true to what we're seeing and more useful to us. So if this kind of view is what we call an isometric view, then a more sophisticated view with kind of where lines converge as they recede away from us and so on is what we might call fancy pants perspective. I think that's a technical term for it. <laughs> but we seldom need to employ it to draw kind of objects of you know, human scale or smaller within our field of vision. I'll go ahead and erase this here as we advance forward, which I will do using the exciting clicker. So for example, here we are, San Francisco Zoo again, this is Boone the Rhino. He's about, uh, about six years old before he turns seven now since I drew him, weighs about, two, uh, weighs about one ton and is basically a big puppy. Um, spends a lot of time just kind of snoozing during daylight hours. This was one of those occasions when he was up and about, foraging, eating apples. Quite a cutie, quite shy. I, I have seen video footage of him being surprised by an apple. <laughs> kind of spring backwards. <laughs> uh. um, right, he's adorable. He's a big boy, a big puppy. If we were to conceive of, say, his body as a simple form to hold it in our minds, how might we simplify that body shape? What is his trunk shaped like? Yeah, we could say that it's kind of cylindrical. The belly curves underneath and so forth. But when I look at that peak spine, to me, it's kind of like a house. Like a little tiny house on legs with this L-shaped head in front. I appear to, okay, I need to keep refastening this because I have it badly clipped on. And what's more, because we're recording this, like thousands and thousands or dozens or two people are going to see me fiddling this microphone and commenting on it repeatedly. Okay. Anyway, so if we can visualize a little toy house and kind of, you know, have that in mind as we're drawing our rhino, it's kind of helpful because we can kind of take the line of the spine and then see a similar kind of relationship between the high points of his shoulders and hips, his kind of rhino elbows and his rhino knees from one knee to the other and relate that to the top points of his hips. And it can help us as we're sketching this guy in to kind of keep things in alignment. If we have kind of in the back of our minds a notion of what he, how he's constructed three-dimensionally, that can help us locate points where we want them to go. It's not a bad idea. I tend to, when I'm sketching, just start him with a pen and cross my fingers and hope for the best. So this is something which I have in mind as I'm drawing. I'm kind of trying to keep at least some of my brain cells working on the task of translating what I'm seeing into some kind of three-dimensional form that will then kind of like guide my hand a little bit as I draw my lines. It would be possible, and perhaps a useful exercise for this kind of thing, to do this structural sketch first, and then if the animal moves on, you can kind of continue fleshing out the anatomy based on whatever he's showing you at any particular point in time and basically hang it on this frame that you'd sketched out. That might be a useful thing to try, rather than trying to do it all at once, or to have this be something you're simultaneously doing in the back of your head as you're just trying to make a drawing. But to me, when I conceive of, of Boone the Rhino in three dimensions, I kind of think of him as being a house with a little peaked roof. His head, sharply L-shaped, the eye kind of nestled down here at the turning point here where his muzzle comes out, long slope of forehead. And so I observe him for a while and I try and get a handle on what I'm seeing. What shape is his head? If I were holding it in my hands, what shape would it make? And then as I draw it, I'm like, okay, I'm having this kind of view on this kind of shape of object. And that helps me kind of get these lines down in a plausible looking arrangement. Likewise, uh, the baboons at the Oakland Zoo, they have a very large family, like a couple dozen of them and they're 
sometimes they are incredibly active, running around, chasing each other up trees, falling out of trees, which doesn't appear to hurt them, um, playing games, tugging on each other's tails. They're pretty lively. And to my delight, I also find them somewhat geometric. They have this square muzzle and this sharp kind of almost step at the brow. And then if their hair comes out of the head and falls onto the shoulders, it kind of curves around their skull in a way that almost makes a head kind of boxy. And as I'm drawing them, I can kind of conceive of them as being perhaps something like this. This, past a certain point, isn't a helpful way to look at a baboon. A baboon is not made of boxes. You're not going to convey the character of the animal or your experience of watching it by turning it into a bunch of polygons, like a like crude 1980s CG. That's not the goal here. It's just to have in mind some notion of what these guys, how these guys are constructed, and how that's going to appear to you. If we look at this baboon, I kind of drew him closer. Um, I'm looking down on them in their enclosure. And so this, if I were to kind of imagine the position of his hands, like the feet of the stork, if they were laid out on some kind of welcome mat, I would see quite a lot of the top of that welcome mat. This more distant baboon, further away from me, closer to my eye level, the area that her hands span is going to appear shallower, or flatter to me. This baboon I'm looking more sharply down on. This one I have more of a side view because she's more distant. Yes? So who here, uh, did anybody here see uh, Jack's presentation on fish drawing? Right, this, yeah, the second part where you get kind of more into three dimensions, I think you had an example where you're kind of, you had the uh, great illustration of you know, likening the fish to like a hot dog, and then kind of drawing in the fins and so forth, and then kind of drawing these little kind of, actually, that's not quite right. I, as I recall in your example, you had these kind of little angular lines that kind of cut across like that, that are parallel to each other that you can use to align the eyes on one side with the eyes on the other. Yeah, so same kind of concept there. You don't have to go all the way to constructing some kind of your Lego block interpretation of that fish in order to just kind of have this kind of three-dimensionality in mind and to relate things on one side to things on the other. The notion that the shoulders of this baboon are roughly aligned thusly, and that's a similar kind of angle what we'd see between one hand and the other is really kind of the crucial thing there. Yeah. So we could have like a little baboon mat this guy's sitting on. If we can visualize that mat, it gives us a sense of what kind of view we have of this guy and it makes him kind of you know, three dimensional to a certain extent. We don't Yeah. But when you block things out, like, like this block here, for, for shaving them, let's do this one. And then you block this out. It, it allows you to get these kind of overlapping lines, and these overlapping lines you drop give you that sense of 3D. Right? So you, you get things like this, not things like, like this. 
this becomes really a grab bag of things we can think about as we're drawing. Maybe here that overlap gives us the information we're looking for about the relationship of the head to the shoulder. Maybe for drawing these hands, we want to think about the welcome mat. Maybe for some other thing, all of a sudden, we kind of think, well, maybe this should be darker than that because it's closer to us. So this is really just a little bag of tricks we can pull out for various parts of our drawing whenever we need it, whenever there's something we want to show. They don't all have to be in there all the time. That would transform the pleasurable experience of, of sketching and nature journaling into a dreary chore where it's like somebody's going to be grading you on it. Oh. Ah. I, I, I have to do that, and I don't like doing it. I certainly wouldn't do it kind of for fun. <laughs> That's not the fun part. So I'd mentioned that uh, the kind of that isometric view, the simple view of objects, is generally all we need. For a very large or very and or close objects, you may start to notice that kind of effective convergence, where these lines are going to kind of draw closer together as they recede into the distance. Recede simply meaning you know to go away, to go away from us. I was trying to fit that into one line on the slide, and so I said recede instead. But yeah, for very large things at a close distance, we may notice that we end up with lines which, if we extended them, would actually draw together and meet at some point. This creates this very kind of exaggerated wide angle effect. Um, it's not something we would use all the time or observe all the time something that really comes into play more when we're looking at very large things. And there aren't that many very large land creatures on the Earth anymore. What would be an example of a large land animal where this might come into play? Cows, cows are big, about like human height. Yeah, if you got very close to a cow, you would see that. Uh, anything bigger? Elephant, totally. And as it happens, I have one in my pocket. Oh, yes. So here says so that the Oakland Zoo, which is the one place in the Bay Area where they actually are equipped to uh, care for elephants in a reasonable way. Um, so this is Madundamela, uh, one of the bigger of their elephants. Well, medium-ish. Osh is the biggest. Anyway, so here, observing Madundamela from pretty close to her eye level, I'm looking down onto their enclosure, but of course she's very tall, and so her head rises up equal to and higher than mine. So if I conceive of this as some kind of block structure, her head is roughly on my eye, on my eye level and not particularly affected by perspective. So if I look down the whole kind of 15, 20 foot height of the elephant down to the ground, that kind of welcome mat formation on which she's standing is something I'm actually looking down on. And so I have a different view of her feet than I do of her head. And as a result, if I were to sketch this in as blocks, I would see these lines kind of converging as they recede away from me. There's an additional kind of subtlety here that uh, I think Jack likes to comment on, and I'll steal his thunder this time, which is even my view of her feet shifts slightly as we go into the distance. The lower feet that are further from my eye level appear more fully rounded. The ones that are a little close, uh, the ones that are further from me appear closer to eye level and a little flatter, like our tree stumps. That's a subtle change, but emphasizing the roundness of the foremost foot gives it a little bit of that stepping out of the picture kind of effect. This is kind of a really extreme example. This is part of a uh, traveling exhibit that's been going around. It went, came through the Academy of Sciences in San Francisco about a year and a half ago. I just saw it again this summer in uh, San Diego, so it's still in circulation. Uh, it's on the subject of whales, their evolution, their cultural history, the different types of lifestyle and so on. And they have a number of mounted whale skeletons, this being the biggest. Um, it's a pair of male and female sperm whales. And I really want 
confronted with this to get across the sheer immensity of these guys. Uh, one way of doing that, so something that I've done in a number of these sketches, little people for scale, little ghost people. I don't care about them, they're just kind of generic representatives of the other people going through the exhibit, but by kind of putting them in there and by establishing, as Ashok was saying, a little bit of an overlap here, we kind of uh, bring them clearly out in front of the platform the whales are sitting on, so we know they're in front. That gives us a little hint as to exactly uh, how big these guys are. It also gives me, as I'm drawing these guys, a little reminder of where my eye level is. Any time I kind of forget my vantage point here, I can just look on the page and remember that it's roughly level with that, that lady's eyes. There is definitely perspective here. There's that sense of the lines converging into the distance. If I try and reconstruct that after the fact, I might end up with something like that. The sense that if I were to draw a parallel line along this guy's back or down the flank of Lady Sperm Whale, those lines would converge together as they recede away from me. We get that very dramatic, kind of exaggerated perspective effect. that's just what I was observing. The platforms they were mounted on were basically glossy and black. Um, they were a little lighter there. It was kind of located under a spotlight. I think the main thing was just